What's happening guys, Salam Mike, back again, back to my roots, fast, loose, rapid fire Q&A. Follow me, Salam Mike, with 2Ks on Instagram if you want to get involved with the questions. If you want to get involved with some live stream, and I am on Twitch, link in the description. We're doing it a couple of times a week when I'm in town. Come chat, hang out, we're building a dope community there. And if you've been living under a rock, Mama's Boys Podcast, me and Omar Isaf, iTunes, Stitcher, soon to be Spotify, SoundCloud, mamasboyspodcast.com. Check it out right now. Here we go. Let's hop into the questions. Fam. <clears throat> Do you ever regret not keeping the gym you open? And would you ever open another one down the road? So for those that don't know, I did open a gym in 2010. Uh, it was a learning experience. Uh, I was going to school. I was coaching basketball. I had a lot of different things. I was training at another gym. I had a lot of different things going on in my life. Uh, at that time, it was a great experience. It was a definitely a learning experience. Um, I don't know, I definitely don't regret uh, closing it. It was time to move on. It was time to do new things. And that's where I end up with super training. That's where I end up uh, where I am today with Instagram and uh, YouTube and creating content. So I'm glad I am where I am. It was a stepping stone to where I am now. Would I open another gym? Maybe. Um, not right now. The timing is not right. It's not right for my lifestyle or my goals currently, but it's definitely been in the back of my head. Uh, but not now. It's a lot of work to open a gym. I think a lot of people think and see these successful YouTubers or businessmen opening gyms, making money and having fun, living the dream, doing what you love, which is awesome. Uh, but know that it's a lot of work and the business plan for a gym, um, you know, on the spectrum of uh, how easy it is, is not very easy. It's difficult. There's a lot of things to worry about, um, a lot of overhead. So we'll see. Business plan wise, not for me. Lifestyle wise, down the road maybe. <laughs> What is the best thing you did as far as treatment when you got your back injury? So I've talked about my back and injuring it a little bit here and there. Now I'm not a doctor. Now I don't have an official diagnosis on myself and I can't officially diagnose you guys. Um, so if you have any back injury, I think you need to go to a doctor, seek professional help. And that being said, you have to figure out what's wrong with your back. Cause what's wrong with my back is not the same as yours. Um, you know, the back's complex. There's many different issues that may cause some back pain. So chances are we're not going through the same thing, but a couple things to look at, a couple things that popped in my head when people ask me about their back injury, because they see me going through it and struggling with it, uh, is one, I'm just being raw. Let's get raw. Oh baby. I like it raw. Oh baby. I like it raw. Shimmy, shimmy, ya, yeah, shimmy, yeah, shimmy, yeah. I think that 50 plus percent of you, you guys and the people that power lift or that are in the world right now are not injured. They have uh, some pain or they're hurt. There's a big difference between being injured and being hurt. If you're hurt, you're kind of beat up. It's uh, less chronic. It's just kind of acute, meaning it's not lasting that long. That's just being hurt. Uh, if you played sports your whole life, you know this. This is every game you've ever played competitively. Being injured hopefully doesn't happen that often or to that many people, but it does happen. That's something that you really have to ch make a big change in what you're doing. Maybe your lifestyle, maybe your training, maybe your form, maybe your technique, maybe your mobility. Um, or if you're injured, injured, you know, you have to lay on a couch and not go to work kind of thing. And definitely seek professional help. Uh, the reason that I think I had an injury this time opposed to being hurt is I've analyzed with myself and a professional eye my technique, my programming, my movement patterns, my tight muscles, loose muscles, mobility, this and that, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. So for me, who's had some back issues my entire life since eighth grade, I've had an issue with my right hip, um, either giving out, feeling weak, uh, locking up on me, uh, that I realized for me, the best thing was just to take six to eight weeks off. Um, and so I did, and now I'm feeling good. So I really paid attention to my posture. I really paid attention to uh, how much sleep I was getting. I paid attention to warming up. Um, I paid attention to this time, um, my technique, which I already felt confident wasn't the issue, uh, and my programming, paying attention to those things. So now, uh, building back up into it, I am more aware of some kind of warming up and doing a little more unilateral stuff. So I'd say for me, the biggest two things are um, taking time off and then two, doing some unilateral work. So I'm doing a little bit of Bulgarian split squats and some lunges uh, just to make sure I'm staying even on my hips. Uh, but for me, I think it was just an overuse thing. I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's a genetic thing or just something from my past. So uh, it's probably something I'm going to deal with forever in my powerlifting career and I'm prepared to do so. What's the best way to increase bench volume on the infinite offseason program? Would adding a bench to the squat day work? Um, so I think for the majority of people, what we need to worry about when we're programming and what he's talking about is the Kaizen infinite offseason. It's a free program. It's in the description all the time if you want to check it out. Um, but they're benching twice a week. One's a little bit more volume day and one's a little bit more of a basic strength day. Uh, and it is a custom 
um, template for you to play with. It's uh, uh, kind of bare bones and you can manipulate it how you want with variations and volume, etc. But um, I think overall arching programming is what we all need to focus on is what is the amount of volume, training, frequency, all that that I need to do to make the most amount of progress? Not the other way around. Not how much volume can I handle to make progress, but what's the least amount of volume, intensity, frequency I can handle to make progress? Because then when you do plateau, we have somewhere to go. Uh, I learned this first in music, talking about a crescendo. A crescendo in music, that was cringy, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, if you start here, you have nowhere to go. You've already hit your ceiling. You have nowhere to build up to. And that's the same with music. You know, a lot of times music will start slow and low and then the beat will drop or then a chorus will hit and then it's loud and powerful and it really uh, draws an emotion and makes an effect into the song. And that's the same with our training. If we already start, you know, doing 10 sets of 10 on squat seven days a week, what are you going to do when you plateau? You have no other option other than to do 20 sets of 10 or train double days or something, which is just absolutely insane. So we want to get away with the minimal amount of training with the most amount of progress, right? Time, uh, time is money and we want to use our time uh, efficiently in the gym and out of the gym. So uh, what I suggest is if you're making progress, benching twice a week with three sets of five and then three sets of ton another day, simple as shit, keep to that. Uh, and then eventually, you know, the more advanced you get, the more um, experience you get, the stronger you get, we can add another bench day in like you suggested, maybe on a squat day, you can add in, you know, a kind of a practice day, five sets of three at 65% just for light stuff. And then you can build all three up together to get more volume, more frequency, uh, and more intensity heading into a gym. What is your favorite candy that doesn't have chocolate in it? Now, I'm not a huge chocolate fan, to be honest. Uh, I like a hint of chocolate in some of my shit. So like, you guys know I like ice cream. So I like some cookies and cream, you know, which is like Oreo chocolate cookie in my vanilla ice cream. Or I like a donut, like say like a, you know, custard filled or a cronut, which is like a drizzle of chocolate on top. I don't like a chocolate, chocolate, chocolate donut. So chocolate candy isn't my favorite thing. Although I do love me like a Twix or a Reese's, right? Which have that hint of chocolate and then a peanut butter or caramel action. If I had to go candy with no chocolate at all, I know, I know Sour Patch Kids is the go-to fitness shit, but that's probably not my thing. Uh, maybe a Starburst? I feel like Starbursts are a little bit underrated uh, nowadays. Starburst is a hell of a candy. Um, I don't know, I don't eat that much candy considering I love junk food, uh, but I'll save it for like ice cream or pastries or something, but probably Starburst if I had to get after it. What is your mental approach when it comes to the heaviest set or the set you want to hit a PR, uh, but you're tired as hell? Um, you know, I think I may not be the, the this may sound arrogant. Uh, I may not be the best to speak about this because one thing I'm always confident in is myself. Um, when it comes to sport or athletic activity, one thing I haven't really struggled with is uh, my mentality going towards something or being confident to take the last shot or be confident to make the last play to win the game or take over a game or to hit a PR. Um, I do get a little fired up, but that's just part of my process. I think that I've talked about this in previous videos, you know, don't go to the, the, the guy that bench press 400 without even trying to learn how to bench press. Go to the guy that benched 315 for five years and had to figure out his way to bench 400. And that's a basic example. What we want is obviously a combination of knowledge experience and uh, coaching experience as well as lifting experience to make the best coach or, or someone just gets it. But point being that, you know, you have to work uh, finding what works for you uh, mentally to get fired up or to be serious or to be cerebral to, to, to lift the most amount of weight. But for me, I just started as I began to coach more and more and more and program more and more just became so simple to me that these are just numbers. So, you know, I pulled 600 last, uh, you know, in July and now I want to pull uh, 605 or 610 three months later that that's just five or 10 pounds more. And so to keep it that simple in your head, uh, it, it becomes a lot less intimidating rather than you think 610 pounds, holy moly, you know, three years ago, I only pulled 400. That's fine. But as you get stronger, as you progress, and hopefully if you're doing the correct things to get stronger and progress, diet, sleep, proper programming, training technique, uh, that your strength's going along with the things you're trying to attempt. I don't, I don't like to attempt weights. I don't know. I'm not trying to go for uh, 75 pound PRs, just hoping it'll lift that day. Uh, I, I go for lifts in the gym, rep PRs or real PRs on the platform or in the gym that I have set myself up to, to hit. And that's why I talk about programming. That's why I talk about lifestyle. That's why I talk about having a plan in business life, et cetera, so that you build yourself up to these things and you can have confidence 
because you did the things necessary day after day, step after step, week after week, month after month, that these things are just gonna happen. I've also talked about why that powerlifting is kind of a boring sport to me in that instance where 600 pounds is always gonna be 600 pounds. If you do the proper things leading up to that and things line up, you're gonna pull 600 pounds, um, which kind of takes the excitement out of it.